Sumant Kuali. He's our VP of Partnerships and Customer Success. Uh, Sumant joined the company around the same time that I did in early 2015. So we've had the pleasure of uh, working together. And, uh, you know, Sumant brings so much to what we do. Uh, he's had leadership roles in semiconductor energy. He joined us from uh, Boston Consulting Group. Uh, and he has really expanded and grown our partnership and customer success program. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Sumat Kuali. Thanks for everyone uh, from Austin and well beyond Austin who have taken the time to be here. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, I'm the VP of Customer Success and Partnerships at Spark Cognition, and many a times people ask me what it means. The partnerships part is clear. On the customer success side, uh, I lead the delivery team. And uh, uh, you know, you have heard, like John say, we set the vision, and then we have to deliver it. And my hair is testament to that. Uh, when I joined Spark Cognition back in 2015, I had a head full of jet black hair, uh, but no regrets. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I have seen I have seen the revolution evolution dichotomy that we talk about. So before joining Spark Cognition, I was a management consultant. Uh, I used to work with the kind of companies you will see represented on this panel, as well as I'm sure represented in this uh, audience. And my job was to help companies get better incrementally. It was evolution, it was one direction, one dimension, one step at a time. And what we are doing at Spark Cognition is nothing like that. It's, it's all about revolution, it's about changing the world. Now, we don't succeed every single day, we don't succeed every single hour, but that's what makes me and everybody else at Spark Cognition get up in the morning and get to work, because we really believe we are part of something big. And that something big goes beyond Spark Cognition. It goes beyond our competitors. It goes beyond our partners. And that's what you will see, is that everybody on this stage, uh, whether they are a customer or a partner, are really a partner in this revolution. I think together we can build uh, the, the, the technology that has evolved so far and also has the promise of evolving even further into the future and making a big difference in the world. So, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Shashel Manning. Uh, she's the Director of Corporate Innovation at Pioneer Natural uh, National Resources. Uh, there, her team is responsible for driving innovation in technology, as well as investments that go with it. Uh, Shashel has had the, the distinction of working with different technologies, from nanotechnology to wireless communication to security and now oil and gas. And I'm very excited and eager to see her presentation. Thank you for the great introduction. It's wonderful to be here today with all of you and Amir and Spark Cognition team. Thank you for having me. I don't have a clicker, so the Wizard of Oz. There we go, behind the curtain. <laughs> So I'm here, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Pioneer while we're trying to find those slides. So Pioneer is an independent national um, oil and gas company, one of those independents. And so what you've heard about Pioneer is you've heard the shale revolution. And so we're primarily in Texas. It's the second largest oil field that we have out in West Texas. And what that means for us is that we're having to use a whole new set of tools and technologies. And we see that AI is a, a huge um, advantage for that. Okay, if I could only get the clicker, there we go. Okay, um, I wanted to show you this slide here, this data of the, um, right here, sorry. Advance the slide, thank you. Ah, <laughs> so if you look at this slide, I wanna show you, I'm gonna make one point here. 2011, Pioneer drilled its first horizontal well. And if you look at the growth, so how do we accomplish this? It's through analytics, it's through high performance computing, hydraulic fracking, and our goal for the future is one million 
in 10. So how do we quadruple our production and do that environmentally friendly and not have to quadruple our employee base? And for that, we've got to bring in different people. We've got to bring in different technologies. Part of what we do, Pioneer, we think about spark cognition and we think about how can all of our projects are employee led. So how do we change the culture and let people within our company start to harness these new techniques? We are using drones and thinking about, um, and Mira spoke about this earlier, about how could we have persistent surveillance in the field? We think about with if it's vertically integrated, how could we have other machines operating together in an array, together? We have tried some early, this is what, some work that we did in 2015, and we used neural nets and we thought, how could a neural net go and identify targets of core? And we did this, and it, our geoscientists said, this is never gonna happen. So we set up this test, and believe it or not, 97.8% accuracy. So there are many high value opportunities for AI, and what we're looking at is on our drilling rig. I wanna share one specific thing, and then I'm gonna conclude. See this, this is a system, and what we don't realize is you're looking at a downhole, bottom hole tool assembly. And what that means is, is that 40% of the time, our tools fail. Now, for those of you that I heard that Boeing was here, we would never think about getting on an airplane that we had 40% of the time the plane would fail. So <laughs> the question is, how could we harness AI, and how, what would happen if we would only have 1% failure? 10% failure. That would be saving billions of dollars for our industry. The other big thing is, how can we leverage operations in science, the subsurface? If we have the second largest oil field in the world, how can we recycle our water? How can we compress our drilling time and operations? And this is something we're looking at high performance computing and can we use potentially AI to go find the, the best places for us to do our, to do our work. Um, it's complicated, <laughs> more com <laughs> very complicated with these stack plays. So I'm here to learn today and to get some time with you and I just wanna thank you again. for that great presentation. Uh, next up, we have Ali Raza. Ali is the president of Dover Energy Automation, and he's worked in this sector for a long time. In fact, Ali, I think, at Caltex was doing IIoT before the world was calling it IIoT, and then we caught up with, with him. Uh, he's held different leadership positions at Honeywell most recently. And at Dover, his team is focused on increasing productivity and ROI for Dover's customers. So I'll hand it off to Ali. So, man. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so Dover Energy Automation, let me just go through the introduction real quick. Uh, so what we do is we actually provide automation solution to oil and gas industry, especially focused on upstream and midstream section or the segment of that industry. Uh, our focus is to provide the value to the bottom line of our, of our customers by providing reliability, efficiency, and safety so that they can operate safely, they can actually get the maximum ROI on the investment on their assets. Uh, we serve the customers through some of the leading brands here that you can see on the right-hand side, or probably left-hand side there. Uh, Winrock, uh, which actually provides asset integrity management solution, uh, compressor monitoring, and so on. Spirit, Theta, and Timberline are very focused on well site automation, where we actually provide solutions for rod pump, BSPs, and so on. Uh, North Seal, we provide... Uh, control valves, yeah, again, uh, for oil and gas, upstream and midstream. And finally, downhole monitoring through our Quartzstein brand uh, that's already out there operating in the field. Um, as we provide all these solutions, I think we also believe that in order to maximize the value to our customers, it's important to make sure that we partner with the right companies and the right partners to maximize that benefit back to the customer. I mean, we know we cannot really do everything by ourselves, so it's important to, you know, to form that solution by basically partnering with 
service providers, with different other technologies, uh, with platform providers, or even you know uh, a, customer, uh, a partner like like Spark Cognition. So, so as, we are, as we are going into this ecosystem, it seems like the ecosystem is actually growing for the benefit of the industry as well. And I think this is where the IIoT power really comes into place, where you really capitalize on that interaction between different key players. Thanks to partners like Microsoft, thanks to partners like Spark, who basically helped us to get to that point. Where now we are taking advantage of physics-based model and also the database models in order to bring those two strengths together to really kick in the value for our customers. And it's all about how we bring in the subject matter expert, the data we collect, and the knowledge that we already have that we collected over the years all together to predict better, to provide the reliability that we talked about, to provide a safe operating parameters to the customer and an environment so that they can actually work in that as well. With that, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, and we we'll move on to the next one. Thanks, thanks so much, Ali. And uh, you know, we we talk a lot in the customer interactions that I have about physics-based models and AI-based models. So I hope we can cover some of that in our in our panel discussion. Uh, next up, we have Ben Wilson. Uh, ben is a technical director at Google. Uh, he's a former CTO of GE Oil and Gas, and he's also held various leadership positions in IBM. So I'll hand it off to Ben. Thank you. Good morning. And my white mic's working? Okay, awesome. Um, well, someone had to show up. It's, it is Austin, it is Texas. Someone had to show up as a cowboy, so that was my job today. Um, I really appreciate being here with Spark Cognition and with so many other of the panelists today because there is so much going on in AI today that no one can do everything yet. And when we go look at what Google's doing, most of you probably use AI that Google uh, does today. If you use Google Photos, you can go inside your Google Photos, type in the word mountain, and it'll find every picture that uh, there's a mountain in. If you go into Google Photos and you type cat, it'll find your cat. It'll find your um, loved ones in there too. And that AI is something that we've built um, as part of, let's see, here we go. There we go. Something we've built a part of, there we go, a inside uh, TensorFlow. We've been working on AI for a long time now. You can see us in uh, AlphaGo in some of our uh, Go uh, projects that we've done. Recently we announced a uh, project where we were teaching uh, AlphaGo how to play chess. And basically all we did was teach it its rules what the board, board is and what all the pieces are. And in four hours, it became the best AI uh, chess player in the world. And that happens because we've made investments like TensorFlow. TensorFlow is an open source uh, cap, uh, uh, AI tool. And this tool, we open source specifically because we realized we don't know everything. We, we open sourced it because we're looking for input from throughout the world to be able to make TensorFlow better. And we bring that back into Google to be able to provide products and solutions that are differentiated in the marketplace. And we think that this is something that's really unique about Google and our ability to be able to go and leverage the crowd, to be able to leverage things like Git, to be able to make things better. Um, hello, there we go. One of the other things that we did is, in being kind of the, if you will, parent of TensorFlow, one of the things we did is we developed some very specific hardware to be able to make it run fast, faster. Something called TPUs, tensor processing units. And basically, we have a tensor processing unit, you can see it up at the top, one card, it's 180 teraflops per TPU. We just announced a couple of weeks ago that we now have a one Google TPU2 pod that's 11.5 petaflops to go run your AI on. Just to give you a reference, right, you can see it on the screen, the, fat, the tenth fastest supercomputer in the world does about 10.5 petaflops. And we're building this because we truly believe AI is gonna be a fundamentally different thing for everyone. I think uh, the presentations today have already spoken a little bit about how AI is gonna change the world, and AI, I, I hadn't heard that, AI is gonna eat software. I think that's very apropos. I think that that is one of the things we're gonna see more and more of, and you see it in Google happening every single day. Um, one of the interesting things, too, is our partnerships and our tools are the things that differentiate us in the market today. 
we don't sit here and purport to say that we're going to be the best oil and gas AI uh, company in the world. That's why we want to partner with companies like Spark Cognition, because we really admire the work they do, because they go look at a very specific industry problem, and they go very deep. Google, we go quite wide. Making partnerships with companies like Spark Cognition to be able to go deep and be able to provide that type of ca capability and technology across industries is something that's really important to us. It's one of the reasons why I'm here, to be able to speak with you all uh, about our capabilities. To give you just uh, one example in the energy industry that we're working on, you can see this is a uh, problem in refracting wells. If you're, whoops, if you're not an energy person, refracting wells is a pretty big deal because you can get more oil out. And the question is, is how much oil are you going to get? How do you go and make sure that happens? And you can see in some of these graphs that as you add more sand, you actually can get more oil. And how do you, or I should say, in, this, in the next case, it's going to be gas. But how do you go get more production? And being able to go predict that is critical so you can decide which wells you want to go frack, refract and which ones you don't. We recently ran a test case. And what you can see here is uh, basically a gas well. And what we're measuring here is temperature. And what you're measuring in this is water versus gas. Water's hot, gas is colder. The blue is what the actual is, and the green line is what we predicted. And we're able to go and take data now today to start to predict the refracting of the well and be able to say, here is exactly what we think the well will produce based on uh, the information we have at, at hand. Now, you can also see it's quite noisy data, too. And with noisy data, it's always a challenge to be able to kind of reduce that noise. We can kind of automagically, if you will, go and reduce that noise and be able to even get a finer grain uh, prediction. And it's really quite helpful. When we go look at solutions like this, being able to go work with partners and be, there's a fly up here flying in my face. Um, I, it almost flew into my mouth, so that would have been really embarrassing. <laughs> I've never had that happen. Um, but uh, I think it's really interesting to be able to go and look at these very deep industry, very specific uh, solutions that AI is going to solve. And I think this is a one, one of the really good examples of it. Um, myself and several of my colleagues are here from Google because we are quite enamored with uh, the work that Spark Cognition is doing. And we look forward to talking to all of you and learning more about th those projects. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Yes, that is my last slide. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'll hand it back. Thanks. Next up is Eric Van Gemeren. Uh, Eric is a leader in technology and marketing at Flowserve. Uh, I have had the pleasure of working with Eric and his team for, for over, well over a year now, and I can vouch for his passion and leadership in the space to bring this technology to the energy sector. Uh, Eric spent over a decade in the Canadian Navy and then followed it up with a stint at PRDM. He's held different positions at uh, Flowserve, and right now, he oversees a bunch of functions which basically are geared uh, towards driving both top and bottom line improvements across the company. So I'll hand it off to Eric. Thanks so much. Good morning, and uh, thanks very much for uh, Amir for uh, inviting us to participate today. Um, Flowserve is probably one of the greatest medium-sized companies you've never heard of. Um, we are an industrial products company. We make fluid motion control products um, for the oil and gas, petrochemical, fine chemical industries. Um, we've been in business 226 years. Um, as a matter of fact, our articles of incorporation were filed the day that uh, George Washington gave his first State of the Union address. And in that time, we've learned a few things. Um, but we've also learned a lot about what we don't know, and that's one of these spaces I'm here to talk about today, and it's through partnerships with companies like Spark Cognition that we're really filling in some of those gaps. So why do we care? Um, so we make giant industrial equipment that wouldn't fit in this room, um, and we sell it to refineries, power stations, etc. Um, but even though some of that equipment is very expensive, take for example an ebulator in an atmospheric distillation column, that one pump would cost about $10 million. Um, but that initial purchase price is only 10% of the total cost of operations of that asset over its lifetime. The, the largest single consumer of cost for that uh, particular pump uh, would be the energy to actually drive it. Next is the maintenance and repair to keep it running. 
Next is the loss of production when it breaks unexpectedly or has to be shut down for predictive maintenance. And collectively, those things make a huge impact on our customer's bottom line. If you think about a refinery, it only makes money when it's actually producing gas, diesel, jet fuel, or whatever. And it's a huge fixed asset cost. So the minute it sits idle, they're losing money. Uh, one of our large customers, a multinational oil and gas company, said just in their downstream assets alone, refining and petrochemical, that cost of lost production is $1 billion in EBITDA per year. So that's a real problem that they're motivated to solve. And we really think that attacking lost productivity and reducing maintenance cost could really move the needle here. Uh, again, you see some of the research that says up to 80% of these losses are actually avoidable. And wasted maintenance spend could be worth as much as $60 billion a year in the continuous process industries. So why, why haven't we figured it out before? Well, turns out it's really hard. Um, traditionally, companies look at a dichotomy between planned maintenance or run-to-fail maintenance. In run-to-fail maintenance, you're on the left side of the curve and you don't do a lot of planned maintenance and you wait for it to go wrong and then you fix it. You can see your planned maintenance uh, costs are very low, your repair costs become very high, but you also have a huge impact in that loss of production because while you're fixing it, you're not making money. On the opposite side of the curve, some companies over-rotate and said, we're going to do a really heavy planned maintenance routine. Now, you actually have to shut the equipment down to do planned, uh, planned maintenance. So your preventative maintenance cost goes up, your repair costs come down, but your lost production opportunity actually goes up as well. So hitting that middle point is really hard to do with today's tools. And it's worth a lot. Imagine if we could say that we could reduce your plan maintenance costs by 50% or your repair costs by 60%, um, increase uptime by 30%. These are things that would have a step change improvement in the profitability of a refinery or petrochemical plant or power generating station. But it, it turns out that the tools that we use today just don't get there from here. Traditionally, when you use statistical models that use a track and trend approach where you capture a baseline and establish upper and lower control limits, don't give you the information that you need to do this. And if I had to take a physics-based approach to developing deterministic models, if I look at every single permutation and combination of both machine and working fluid, it would take us multiple human generations to be able to get through that. So there has to be a better way, and this is where AI enters the picture. But to understand what the functional requirements are, let me give you an example. Imagine you're driving your car down the back roads of some area of the world that you're not terribly familiar with, and you're in a rental car, and suddenly the check engine light comes on on the dashboard. Now, being an engineer, you know that, well, that check engine light could be simply that when I last filled it up with gas, I didn't tighten the gas cap tight enough, okay? Or it could be that, hey, the oxygen sensor is gone on the car um, and you're no longer meeting your environmental regulations. But there's not a darn thing you can do about it driving on a back road in the middle of the night. Or it could be that you've just lost lubricating oil and you're about to have a spontaneous disassembly of the prime mover. That's a problem, right? If you don't know which one it is, if you don't know the root cause, you don't know what to do. You can't make an informed decision about do I pull over on the side of the road and take cover or do I just ignore it and keep go on going. So I need to know the root cause and you also need to know, well, is this something I need to fix now or is this something I can wait until I next fill up with gas or my next oil change or that kind of thing. And please, don't give me a false alarm because I'm driving in the middle of an area I've never been before um, and you give me one of these alarms and the last thing I want is to be jumping at shadows. And these are the four things that today's tools don't provide. And this is what, through our partnership with Spark Cognition, we're finally being able to do for the first time. And it's because of the insight and the capabilities that AI now adds to the equation. Um, and uh, FlowServe's approach in this is, again, we're not an electronics and software company. We're really good at making metal shavings. We're really good at making giant pieces of equipment. 
We're not good at writing software or creating electronics and that kind of thing. So our approach has been stick to what we're really good at. We want to be the experts in the analytics and predictive power, and we want to partner with corporations like Spark Cognition. So I'm very proud to have been an early customer of Spark Cognition. We've been working together now for many years. Um, we have got a number of customers who are up and running uh, with this technology today. Um, this has been, an, uh, um, we finally hit that critical mass point just recently now where we're seeing a big demand for this. And but for the partnership that we have had with Spark Cognition, we wouldn't have been able to make that possible. So again, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude for Amir and his team for making that possible and making us look good. Um, I look forward to the rest of the agenda and talking to each of you later on. Thank you. I think we can take a so I have a few questions that I have prepared that I would like to get everybody's view on. Uh, but we would, we would love to have audience participation if you have any questions, given the material you have seen so far that you think are particularly relevant, would love to incorporate those in. So one of the first things I would like to ask the panel is, is build versus buy decisions. I mean, there's, there's always an advantage of going with, with uh, best of breed providers, whether it's Spark Cognition, Google, uh, partnership thereof, or somebody else. Uh, there's also an advantage to building things in-house and building a competitive moat around them. Uh, how have you seen this decision being tackled? I'll, I'll start with you, Sashel. So for us, it's simple. We only have 3,800 employees. So <laughs> it's a very simple decision. But what is challenging or how we have to approach build versus buy is we have to think about how do we have new models of partnerships. So the traditional CIO, you know, you have to think if you're going to go implement an AI capability, it's going to be completely new. So you have to be ready to think about how you're going to truly partner and go and tackle those problems. Got it. Anybody else would like to weigh in? You, you know, uh, we suffer from, from many of the, the same issues. Uh, we have 18,000 employees, and we like to think that we have solved all the world's problems if only our customers understood it as well as we did. So it took us a long time to realize that there's things that we don't know that we don't know. And uh, um, it also took us a long time to get to the point where we had to accept the fact that there was other organizations that could do it much better than we can. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to find a partner that would uh, you know, walk before they ran with us. And uh, we have since been able to, to focus on our knitting, um, you know, using the, the time old phrase. And uh, that has allowed us to accelerate our time to resolve. So for us, the make-buy decision was really a function of how long it was going to take us to develop the solutions that we needed and how quickly we'd be able to evolve them over time, recognizing the things that we're good at and the things we're not good at. And this was one of the things which we just weren't good at. Yeah, I think it, it's, it is also a function. It, it's really a business decision, right? At the end of the day, uh, you really need to figure out what you're good at and what you're not and where you want to really invest those dollars in, right? And, and this is where, where you are. You actually want to develop this asset base where you keep on investing into those assets, whether you want to do it into AI function or an automation function or probably your own domain that you have uh, already people in there. So for us, the decision was, and I think every company actually went through the same thing. You just run it like, you know, I can do it. Uh, yeah, this is easy. I have a bunch of programmers sitting in the back. But at the end of the day, you really need to make the decision about what are your core competencies and how you want to develop that business around that core competencies. And then look for the partnership. And I think as the business is transforming, the new business dimensions are asking for that ecosystem that I talked about as well. Uh, because without that, uh, the reality of IIoT or the reality of AI is not going to be recognized. Yeah, I mean, I at Google, we've, I've seen personally, you know, roughly about 100 companies come through who are looking to go and use AI in one way or another. Some look like um, FlowServe, some, and they, they've made the choice to go and use a partner to go do that work. There are others who've decided they're going to go build a product, and they're going to resell that product to a, to a customer. Those companies typically are doing it internally, and they want to build their own capabilities to go do that, because it's going to be a real product they're going to charge real money for. When you're in that situation, we're seeing more and more customers choosing to go do that. If you're just going to use it to be able to optimize your operations, we're oftentimes seeing partners get involved, 
like a spark cognition to go and help solve specific industry problems. Um, I don't think there's one answer to this. We're on the very, very beginning of this journey. Um, I think everyone here back, if, if we were back in, say, 1986, how many people would say we're going to have fleets of programmers that are going to be sitting there programming uh, applications for us in our business? Probably not very many. Today, that's the norm. And so I think what we're going to see over time with AI is you're going to see AI take on more and more capabilities. They're going to make it easier and easier to use so that you can actually have your own people go do it. But we're at the very beginning of this today, and I think you're seeing a lot of companies who are going to choose to build real products, they're going to have those uh, developers. Very helpful. Uh, let me ask about the challenges in adopting this technology and driving this forward. Uh, in my, in my previous job, I found the hardest tasks I had when I, when I was not driving just technical change or a process change, but managing that change and ruling it out across 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people. That was usually the toughest piece of the change. Where do you see the biggest challenges with the adoption of this technology? Is it technical or is it more change management slash cultural? You want to you wanna go first, Eric? We can go in that. Sure. I, I would say internally our biggest challenge has been getting access to clean and meaningful data. Um, despite the fact that we have an installed base of more than 3 million assets worldwide, um, it's just shocking how little information we actually have about those assets running out in the field on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the key things that you need to support a, an initiative like this is, is good data. Um, so, you know, it, it took us some investments to, to go out in the lab and start creating data. Um, but even then, you know, when you've got um, an asset that costs you a million dollars to build, you're not going to run it to failure in the lab just to capture some data, right? And that's, again, where we didn't know what we didn't know. And thanks to some of the IP brought to us by Spark Cognition, we were able to adapt to see how machine learning could be used to fill in the gaps in our knowledge base where, where we didn't have data. Um, externally with our customers, it's, it's a big culture shift. Um, I was talking this morning before coming in here, uh, we were having a debate as which is the most risk averse customer on the planet, the oil and gas customer or the nuclear navy. Um, you know, and it's kind of a toss up, um, but uh, <laughs> you know, our customers are such that uh, you know, the cost of failure for them is incredibly high. And you need to be able to demonstrate to them that you actually have credibility and that this isn't going to make the situation worse. And unfortunately, while this is a topic that a lot of people talk about, it's not a topic people understand well. So there is a huge change management aspect of this when you're working with our customer base. Yeah, I mean, I, I also think from, a, um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions. People look at it as a, like a black box, you know, stick in some data and some good things will uh, come out. And there are certain scenarios where sometimes that does work. But I think being able to go into your industry, finding a specific use case, and being able to understand how that use case is actually going to fundamentally change your business. So you can do margin expansion, or you can do accretion of revenue because you've got a new product. Those very specific use cases are what you have to define up front. The second step is data. And I, I would also say, Eric, data is, is one of the most difficult things to be able to go and get and make sure it's right. And then being able to clean that data also. But I, I really look at the use case as the thing that you got to get right first. So I showed you a picture of this cognitive core picture where the geoscientists, we had them go, had a geoscientist train and use, using AI and some neural nets. And what the challenge was, is after we went through it, the geoscientist looked at me and he goes, well, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> what am I gonna do now? If this can, if this can go find 97, 98% accuracy, and I spent three to four months, what do I do? And so I see that as one of our challenges of how are we gonna go take people that normally were so used to doing one task, and now all of a sudden they have this incredible capability, what are they gonna do next? Got it. So yeah, sense. I think uh, from my experience, what I have seen so far is uh, I think the technology piece is relatively easier. Uh, when it comes to technology adoption and also especially the whole digital transformation, the biggest challenge that we see is the whole change management piece, as you talked about that, right? And this is where uh, a natural resilience against, you know, I don't really, I want to just preserve what I have and I really don't want to cross that chasm. I think that is something that we fight a lot internally within the organization and also with the customer organization as well. 
and that came across like a normal routine every time we hit a new customer. Uh, since we are talking about oil and gas, and we have a heavy representation of that on this panel, I have seen that data issues tend to be particularly complicated in oil and gas. <laughs> I mean, I would say FlowServe is almost one end of the spectrum where it's, it's relatively clean in terms of who owns the data. Uh, but with the, with the more complex supply chains, uh, with, with, with folks owning the assets, somebody else being responsible for running it, and delivery times and so on, uh, have you seen any innovative approaches that different folks have come up with to share data across the ecosystem for everybody's benefit? Well, from a technology perspective, we really think that there's a real power in being able to bring the data back to a central area so that you can leverage the network effect and share learnings from one asset to another um, very quickly. Um, but the reality is customers are at different points on that adoption spectrum. Even <coughs> within an incredibly conservative customer base like oil and gas, we have some customers that say, no way over my dead body. The data is not leaving the four walls of the plant ever, and uh, we're not even going to let you get access to it. Um, we have other uh, customers in exactly the same organization that says, what do I care? It's just sensor data. It, you know, so you can't do anything with it because it's not used for control, and therefore they're okay with it. So I think it's still really early days to be able to declare success. Um, in our case, the solution was you had to have a flexible architecture that if the customer was on one end of the spectrum and said, no way over my dead body, we could say, okay, sure, no problem. We'll, we'll work in that environment. And if they were more um, you know, progressive and willing to think differently, we would say, okay, well, great. We can take advantage of that too. Um, so I think the important part at this level of, of maturity in the organization is flexibility and adaptability. And you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Yeah, I think uh, oil and gas is still struggling with that whole concept of data sharing, even for the betterment of the overall industry as well. Uh, I think there's a lot of pushback on data sharing, as you said, right? Uh, so data segmentation is important. I think that is where we need to go in order to make sure what is shareable and what is not, what needs to be within my firewall and what can go out. I think heavy machinery industry has done good good work on that one, and they have done some segmentation where you can actually say that this is outside and this is inside, and this is what I can share. But I think oil and gas still has to go through it. Uh, they're, they're still working on it. <laughs> yeah, so so from, from an independent standpoint, as an independent, we, ha we a Pioneer, we have to share with other independents. We don't have thousands of people. Mo the challenge is, I think, several years ago, we were looking for where can we find this data, and we, I went out to Midland, and I went, why are all the trucks at the Dairy Queen? What's what, what people like <laughs> love ice cream out here? What's going on? Well, the challenge was the Dairy Queen was the only place that had the Wi-Fi hotspot <laughs> for people to upload their data. So I think yeah. even stepping back, we're going to have to, how do you build out communications? How do you have systems to go collect data? How do you become somewhat vertically integrated so that you can even get to that step? So that's what we're working on. Absolutely yeah. true. That's an awesome story. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't have that problem at Google, obviously. <laughs> we got Google Fiber right down the street. <laughs> so since we are talking about the future, what I would ask you is, let's say we are sitting here, hopefully a bigger hall, by 2023, and we are talking about the future, what, what should be, what, what do you think is the most surprising thing that's going to happen in this industry in the next five years? I think it really comes down to the, uh, the nature of the people that are in the business. Um, in the oil and gas business, it used to be that uh, when you went out onto the uh, refinery floor, there was a guy in a Nomex suit with uh, steel toes and a hard hat on, and he'd been there for 30 years, and he could look at a piece of running equipment and scratch his temple and say, I know what's wrong with it. Um, and he was proud to be able to do that. Um, already today, that guy is gone, and it's been replaced by a millennial um, who is in a gig economy, and he wants to do this for a year or two before moving on to something else. Um, and I think that change in the workforce is going to force solution providers like us to completely rethink the way that we deliver our products and services. And, and maybe start to completely re-innovate our business model 
and get to the point where maybe someday we'd actually even sell production equipment anymore. You know, maybe you know we could someday go the way of the aerospace industry where we sell uh, uptime and power by the hour, or we sell reliability or, or, or something. So this kind of technology, I think, is opening up uh, new ways of doing business that allow us to capitalize on some demographic trends in our end user base that could fundamentally change the way that we do business. And, and, and that's perhaps the scariest part yeah. for us. Um, but it's one that we have to adapt to. I'd have to say I think about energy independence, about how do you have energy that's clean, how do you have it so anyone can have it. I mean, so that's, before it used to be You'd hit, you'd have to drill, you know, I have Tom out here in the audience, he'd talk about his, his dad and say, you know, you got to go drill eight, and you hope out of the eight, one or two hit. Now you know exactly that there is oil, there is natural gas, so it's, how do we do that? And I think I'm excited to see what people come up creatively, what AI comes up with, but um, it's competitive, too. So we're in a competitive landscape, and... I think we, we have a um, responsibility to take some of these very advanced techniques and tools now so that we, you know, what do we give to our future, right? Yeah. I think the next five years is, is more focused on business transformation, which is enabled by technology. That's how I see it. And as you said, you know, subscription models coming in and then, you know, reducing the capex, working more towards the opex, you know. Even when we talked to some of the EPC vendors a long time back, I mean, they were talking about, are we really going to be building those iron and steel? And then who is going to be owning that? Who is going to be funding this? So I think the business model transformation is going to happen in the next few years, which will be enabled through technology. So, so that's the biggest change that I see, really. See. So I'll take a little bit different track than try to talk about the technology, because I think Google's view on... AI and technology is fairly well known. But I think what we're going to see is a digital leadership transformation. I think the challenge we face today is actually in the boardroom. It's not necessarily the leaders who are in charge. I think the boardroom has to change. The leaders that are in there don't understand technology. Uh, I've spoken to enough boards to talk to them, and you know, they, many of them have trouble using an iPhone and adding new apps to the iPhone and how to go, go make the apps work with each other. If you can't understand those basic concepts, there's no way you're going to understand how AI is going to affect your business. There's no way you can develop a strategy that's going to change your business and make it a digital business. I think those things are going to change over the next five years because you're going to see the laggards in, in every industry start to lose to digital natives. And you're going to see, also see over time the CEOs, CFOs, COOs all change over who are actually digital natives. Now, I'm not saying that there's anyone over 50 is you know, going to be out of a job. That's not my point at all. I mean, we look at Eric Schmidt. I don't think he's 50. I think he's a little bit older than 50, and he's our chairman, and he leads everything that Google does. And you go, look, it's going to be those people who actually know that transformation. I think there's a digital leadership transformation that's going to take place. That's a great point, Ben. I was hoping you take this opportunity to announce the Google drill, but we'll leave that <laughs> for another year. Uh, okay. Well, with that, uh, Eric, Ali, Ben, Sachel, I would really like to thank you for an engaging discussion and for the presentations and for the audience for being uh, involved and a great audience. And uh, uh, hope, hope we can continue the discussion uh, uh, further along lunch and other breaks that we have. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.